kind of gets forgotten mm. with them all. And like, I remember him popping up on Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Mm. And it was like, oh my God. It's, but, but I just loved his guitar playing at the time. And to, for me, he was not the face of Fate No More, but he was mm. kind of like a big, big, Watch big fa- Fate with. No More. Yeah. yeah, it was the beard and everything about it. Yeah. It's just, and it was so what the, the whole lot of them coming mm. together like that it was just such an odd kind of a thing. But like, um, like at the time, which we'll get into later, but Angel Dust, not that it tanked, but it was kind of commercial suicide because it was so different mm. from what went on before. But it was them being true to themselves, which is kind of like a running team with Fate No More anyway. And well, that's uh, what you want in like your musical artists. Yeah. You want them to sort of put out what they are. Mm. Exactly. And they were still massive. But it, yeah, I think mm. it really, it, it was the time it, it opened the floodgates for Mike Patton to go off and kind of like stretch his creative Mm, uh, thing wings. yeah um so kind of like uh, on the back of angel dust as well mike patton started going back playing with mr bungle and uh starting to get involved in other projects which at the time was like fucking severely frowned upon because mm. it was like no you can't do this you really it was always seen as being like but like fate no more were cool about it because mm. it, it's throughout their history always hear about them falling out with each other and arguments and this and that well, I've read a few different bits and pieces where they all said it's probably the most democratic band that any of them were ever in, where everyone was like, yeah, if you want to do that, you do that, you do this. And mm. they all, they really worked, they really gelled. Yeah. But I think when um, Martin led, I think after Angel Dust, things started going a little bit downhill uh, for him. Like the, their biggest kind of single off would probably would have been um, the Commodore's cover version of Easy which was played like extensively over I don't think it was on the American release but it was on the European release and it was like a massive yeah, hit over everyone here everyone knew it yeah and yeah. the course Midlife Crisis yeah. was like the other kind of like you know big one but you look at songs like Jizz Lover and as well the themes that the, they're not kind of like they, they don't necessarily speak to everybody's everyday experience I suppose mm. necessarily <laughs> Yeah, it's just, but then you think it's not all about like baby you broke my no, heart. No, it's 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 like it's there's some fucking dark stuff on Angel Dust, and it's brilliant. Like mm. I remember hearing it the first time I heard it, blew me away. Never heard anything like it before. Mm. It's still there's not much like it out there at mm. all. Um, and then King for a Day, Fool for a Lifetime, uh, came out in '95, and it was, it was a good few years fucking after. Oh no, actually, yeah, it would have been uh, around three or four years between albums not two levels of years yeah. though no and like I mean it was it was different from I suppose it was a step away from they were still being experimental but it, I don't know to me it sounded more grounded kind of like more of a rock kind of album mm. or the guitars it seemed more kind of like guitar and bass driven than mm. keyboard driven and yeah like the big ones off that were Digging the Grave Evidence and Ricochet but had some fucking kind of like you know mental fucking songs on it as well kind of like happy birthday fucker <laughs> um, and I'm just a man and th- th- there was like you know good mixture of stuff but it, it didn't do as well as Angel does as well. mm. it was kind of like the feeling was that they were away for too long or they missed out on things yeah didn't quite cash in yeah but I think as well kind of like the, the, the musical soundscape was changing at the time as mm. well and the people were I suppose in the midnight it was like grunge kind of time or kind of grunge was just over and people were a bit, you know. Yeah. Um, kind of like more electronic music was on the rise and... Great pop and all that yeah. kind of stuff, yeah. Um, so I, I think maybe they didn't have the... But it's still, I think it, it, it's a fantastic album. It would be my favourite album, but it'd be close second, mm. I think, um, for it. And then they did Album of the Year, which would have been around 98, which was a little bit more disjoint. And all between these periods, they never really settled on any one guitarist either. So they were just saying that people were losing interest in it and because they weren't, they didn't feel as if they were creative enough and they didn't have that spark, I suppose, that was there with them originally. So Album of the Year is pretty much considered to be one of their, their worst mm. albums, um, which it's all right, but it's... It's Which different. Is, I think it's more mellow. There are some bangers that you... No, well, I suppose a bangers is probably not a good way to describe it, but mm. like really, really solid singles that like would always... I have an eternal playlist that kind of rolls on mm. that I always have songs on from the whole time. And like two or three songs off that album have been on my eternal playlist mm. that never fall off it. They've been on it for like they, the past yeah, 20 yeah, there's years. Great, there's great... Like, I mean, I don't think there's any bad fate mm. no more stuff but kind of like compared to the other i think yeah. it, it seems more of a, a mature album as well i yeah. think too i think it just happens with people like you get your musical ch- taste change it's not as heavy it's more i suppose 
middle tempo yeah, kind of it's, it's more lounge kind of like music I think and, yeah. um, uh, anything but yeah that, at that stage kind of like mm. I think they were they were pretty much nearly done like Patton was off kind of like you know with um, Tomahawk and Phantomus and stuff and then they ended up uh, breaking up for what, about a decade mm. I think and then they got back and they did a couple of gigs in the late 2000s and then in the end the ground they kind of like decided that they really liked it and they decided that they were going to get together whenever they could and start putting albums or music together um not not with a goal of release now i think just because they enjoyed it and they forgot mm, how much music. so without any pressure on they kind of like basically put an album together and then it came out in 2015 mm-hmm. um it's all invictus and it's yeah they came back they made a come mm-hmm. but they're they're still back together but they don't really we were due to see them this year but yeah. like coronavirus yeah yeah, um, coronavirus and so on. And so it's, it's. It. I think that's the thing about they. They're with each other, but there. There's no pressure on them to kind of like you know, kind of like release stuff and yeah. put things out there the whole time, which is great. Which kind of like says that they're probably going to be around for the foreseeable future. And as well, they all have their own different bits and pieces. That's the thing. They? That it's it's more a sort of a, a passion project rather than a I yeah. must do this to earn the money mm. project kind of thing. Which means that probably anything they will release will be something that they feel passionate enough about to release, and that it will be you know something mm. that they actually enjoy doing rather than something they must do. Exactly. And like, I mean, the, the whole thing with Fate No More, I suppose it's, it's, it, it, they're, I think a lot of their, like Angel Dust at the time, a lot of people, unless I think you kind of got what was going on, hmm. didn't like it because it was too, and it, there was too much of a change in kind of like, you know, different kind of styles through it where people were like, oh, that this doesn't, whereas I was like, oh my God, this is fucking amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but then people were looking back and going, "Oh wow, this is like a really inflated it's great." And I think it was the same with King for a Day, and it's probably going to be the same as well with Album of the Year and probably Sol Invictus. Like, I'm not overly crazy on Sol Invictus, but I still think it's a great album. Mm. But I wouldn't be my first album that I kind of no, it wouldn't be the one you put on into. first. Yeah, but yeah, they, they've had like loads of well, not really loads of changes over the years, but you know, like, I mean, it's Bored and Gould, Bottom and Patton have been really kind of like an open mm-hmm. thing between. Um, well, yeah, so that's, that's nice. kind of like a, a quick rundown of Fate No More. Fate no More. There is um, a book out, which I think it's like an unofficial thing. I don't think Mike Patton really contributes to, but some of the other guys contribute to it. It's written by an Irish author, funnily enough. Um and uh, if people are interested in it, just Google it because I can't remember the fucking name. But it's probably oh like the un- it's probably what like, is wrong with your it's memory? probably like the unofficial history of Fate No More. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, go and check that out. Uh, now yeah. we'll kind of like bust into the rest of the stuff and get into kind of like you no know, deep dive mm-hmm. into Angel Lust, and we'll see what Mark and Jen think of it. Indeed, I would imagine they probably don't like it. <laughs> Yeah, so enough about the history of Fate No More. So this week we're looking at the classic album Fate No More's Angel Dust, which to me is probably one of my favourite albums of all time. It's after influencing a whole generation of different bands, uh, for good or bad. It's been kind of like cited as being one of the big influences on new metal. Uh, well, not just that fate no more, I suppose in general, because they kind of and pretty much it's like a genre uh, defying album. Or defying, not defying, denying. Defying. Defying, but it's not. It doesn't defy a genre. It kind of breaks all genres because the whole thing is you can't. It defies categorizing them. Yeah, it defies well. categorizing. Yes, yes me okay. English no good. Can't be boxed. That's in. impossible. Mm. Mm, yeah, but it was, I suppose, one of not the first of, but for a band like Fate No More, they were they fucking made it massive with the real thing, and it, it's they had a pretty much a sound that was consistent throughout that, and then they're fucking massive and they go off and they do this album there was like fucking millions pumped into the making of this album they had a press in with them the whole time there was a documentary which wasn't very common at the time of them making the album because people thought this is going to be this is like the biggest band on one of the biggest bands on earth this album is going to be massive and they just it was like a massive two fingers up to the world they just went off and did their own thing was the two thumbs up the fingers nose 
definitely two kind of like shit smeared middle fingers <laughs> to the world where they're just like no we want to do what we want to do I remember reading an interview with him and uh, it was like they said like a producer turned around to him and said have you bought houses yet and they were like yeah and they're like because it was just seen that it was like commercial suicide uh, uh, a lot of people thought this album and it would have, and at the time it didn't do great when it came out yeah because it, 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 it completely they completely changed their tone uh, or kind of style with this album then they they kind of reinvented themselves to a degree that's what Pretty I much, like, came out of it looking into it now I wouldn't have been a Fate No More fan before this so like none of this kind of oh I listened to their last album and this album is completely different or anything like that came out when I was looking at it I was just kind of digesting the album as it's this lone entity but it sounds like the way you were saying it that they kind of really took a risk with this one this is Mike Patton basically got his stamp on this one yeah it? it was yeah like it's the other albums were written before the last album where Mike Patton came in on the last album um, this, which was the big album that they had uh, fucking uh, introduced yourself as their forest album although technically not really their forest one like the real thing it was um, it kind of went on that crest of MTV as well Epic the, the music video everyone loved it MTV played it to death and they made um, Fate No More massive they were like playing fucking massive stadiums around the world they were like opening up for Guns N' Roses uh, which didn't go with it they were just going mental all the the, the mad shit that they were doing started becoming things a legend and like like when they were like playing with Guns N' Roses they were constantly arguing with fucking Axl Rose he used to piss on his teleprompter they were just like they were fucking mental like they were proper kind of like mental <laughs> <laughs> Rock stars. It's like that they're kind of like antagonists or ag- antagonists. Yeah, they're an- antagonizers. That was uh, a bit extreme, were- all right. <laughs> mm. But all what there was stuff like Mike Patton used to like put shit into a bag and put it into kind of like the ventilation system in hotels and sounds were- delightful. A- any reason mm. for that? Like, did, did he did he ever for shits and was- giggles? Literally, oh. yeah, well, it was, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. It was Get just, out. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like having fun I have um, to say as you do yeah. Yeah. Well, because they weren't they like even when they were like I mean to try and explain kind of Angel Dust even kind of before we get into kind of, like the different songs and it's what they they were always like they'd go against everything so kind of like they were seen as kind of, like Fate No More kind of seen as a funk kind of punk band so what they used to do is they do cover versions of Black Sabbath songs which used to metal that used to annoy punks at the time you know the things didn't go together so they'd always go against the grain um and then it was like for some reason fucking uh, it's, I don't know kind of why the real thing like the MTV thing I think really kind of blew it off but then people were expecting more of the, the same and kind of more commercial stuff because like uh, Epic got played fucking everywhere like on the den nearly once a week it was played on the den Children in Ireland. Yeah, people are going to watch yeah. the den. Yeah, oh, yeah well, that's, that's great. what the whole thing is. <laughs> so, we just had the uh, good old uh, Dan over with his uh, watercolour paintings for the week, and now we're going to listen to some Fate No More. Yeah. yeah. Watch out for that plastic bag full of shit, kids. Yeah, but what people mean, <laughs> because like this song was so big, and people thought, oh, you want it all, but you can They didn't really. Because I didn't look into the lyrics so it, that's basically about Mike Patton's uh, kind of like distaste for sex at the time. And as well, then other people thought that it might have been about fucking people that liked eating shit. Um, it was a, but like this was like a it's mainstream shit. song. What is it? Yeah. Um, and then fucking um, thing Angel Dust came along. Like they would, they, I think they deliberately went in. And as well, like you were saying, it's because the album was already written when Mike Patton came in on the last one. Uh, on the real thing he only put the, the lyrics in on it and didn't have much of a contribution to the musical style and then on this one he did and then kind of like the guitarist Jim Martin had more of a kind of like he stood back a bit more on it he didn't really like the direction it was going because he was more kind of like heavy metal orientated and like this album has a mixture of fucking everything from funk to kind of swing to kind of like weird black metal kind of kind of latin there's there's anything yeah, there's you can everything think and of, anything on it um, but like i mean that's a, like we say like i mean it's definitely one of my favorite albums and as well because of the lack of genres in it and the, the crossover you know like the mixture of rap metal fucking all these different things they influenced a load of metal bands that would have ended up going on kind of like 
kind of like new metal bands and experimental metal bands in the ninety or in the, the late nineties and the early two thousands, like Fate No More, far reaching kind of like um, fingers into things. But the they, only other comparable act, I suppose, would be Rob Zombie for the weirdness. I think really, yeah, and not even sound. Like and he wouldn't have been no. anything like as fucking weird so, as yeah. yeah. But what did you take it? Make it a whole album because I take it this is your first kind of listening to Fate. 